Suppose we come across a wild vector field, and through it we draw an oriented curve. Previously we've talked about the meaning of the vector line integral over this curve. Roughly, it measures how much the vector field flows with the curve. It measures the flow along the curve because when we compute such a line integral, we dot the vector field with the unit tangent vector along the curve. But what if we want to measure how much the vector field flows through the curve? In other words, we want to measure the flow in a perpendicular direction to the curve rather than a tangent direction. Well, instead of dotting the vector field with a unit tangent vector at every point, we could take each of those tangent vectors and rotate them by 90 degrees to the right to get a unit normal vector. These blue vectors are all perpendicular to the red curve. So if we integrate the dot product of the vector field with the normal vector, we're measuring how much the vector field flows through the curve. This quantity is called the flux of the vector field through the curve. This isn't a new kind of vector line integral or anything like that, it's just a specific kind of scalar line integral. And you can think about it as measuring something sort of dual to what a vector line integral measures. So as usual, before we do an example, I just want to remind you how to compute this. As with any kind of line integral, your first step is to parameterize the curve. So this will involve writing down an x and a y component in terms of t, and a parameter domain for t from a to b. And then what? Well, think about how we compute a regular vector line integral. The integrand is the dot product of the vector field with the unit tangent vector which, using a parameterization, we can alternatively compute the vector field of the parameterization dot r prime. But this isn't what we want. We want to compute the flux. So I'll take each of these r... So I'll take each of these r prime vectors and rotate them 90 degrees to the right. How do we do this mathematically? Well, r prime is the vector x prime of t, y prime of t. So a vector orthogonal to that vector would be, for example, y prime of t, negative x prime of t. You can just check that the dot product of this vector with the orange r prime vectors is zero. Once you multiply this dot product out, you have a single variable calculus integral, and you can evaluate it. So computing the flux of a vector field through a curve is the same as setting up a vector line integral, but instead of using r prime, you reverse the order of the components and then add a negative sign to the new second component. Now as a quick warning, you should note that there are two different choices of normal vector that you could make y prime negative x prime is one of them, but the negative of that vector is also a normal vector. Negative y prime x prime would be pointing to the left. And the truth is, there's no good reason to prefer one over the other, so we choose one just by convention. For us, we will use the vector pointing to the right. In other words, we will always use the normal vector y prime negative x prime. But in real life, it's just a choice. And choosing one versus the other will just introduce a negative sign into your final answer. Okay, let's look at an example and compute the flux through some curve. In this problem, I'm giving us a vector field, x, y, 
and I want to compute the flux of this vector field through the piecewise smooth curve, which is described as follows. We travel from the point negative 1, 1 to the point 1, 1 along the curve y equals x squared. And then from there we travel back to the point negative 1, 1 just along a straight line. Let's draw a picture. The vector field xy is a radial looking vector field. It's zero at the origin, and then it points outwards everywhere else, and it gets longer as you move outwards. And then we have two portions of this curve. One of them is defined by y equals x squared. And we're traveling from negative 1, 1 to 1, 1, so we're going this way. And the other part of this curve is the straight line going from 1, 1 to negative 1, 1. Now just as a sanity check to make sure that we understand what's going on, if I draw the normal vectors in here, because I'm traveling this way along the curve, and I want the normal vectors to be to my right, the normal vectors would look something like this. And by just eyeballing the blue vectors against the green vectors, I can see that for the most part, they're traveling in the same direction. More specifically, I can see that the dot product of most of these vectors is positive. So it seems like at the end of the day, we should get a flux, which is positive. The vector field is moving through the curve in a positive manner, whatever that means. Now to actually compute this, we're going to have to split the curve up into two pieces. There won't be a way to deal with the whole curve in one go. So I'll let C1 and C2 denote the two components of the curve. And I'll label them in the picture. C1 is going to be the x squared thing, and C2 is going to be the straight line. And we'll compute the flux of the vector field through each curve separately. Integration over curves is additive, so once we do that, we can just add the numbers together, and that will give us the flux through the entire curve. Let's do C1 first. What do we need to do? We need to parameterize the curve. Because the curve is given by the equation y equals x squared, we could declare x to be t, and then y has to be t squared. And because x is ranging from negative 1 to 1, this is what t will range from. And this is the correct direction because we travel from the point negative 1, 1 to the point 1, 1. Now we need the normal vector. Well, r1 prime is 1 comma 2t. So based on what we talked about before, to get a normal vector, we can switch the order of the components and then add a negative sign in the new second component to get the vector 2t negative 1. And this should make sense geometrically if you look at the picture. On the x squared component, all of the normal vectors are pointing down. In other words, the y component of all of those normal vectors should be negative, and in fact it is. Then we're ready to compute the flux through this curve is going to be the parameter bounds give me the integral bounds, so from negative 1 to 1. And we have f of the parameterization, so f of t, t squared dot the normal vector, 2t negative 1. The vector field here is x, y. So f of t, t squared is just going to be the vector t, t squared. And then this dot product becomes 2t squared minus t squared, which is t squared. An antiderivative is t cubed over 3. Plug in 1 and negative 1 and subtract, and you should get 2 thirds.
Now we can do the same thing for C2. C2 is a straight line. So I'll parameterize it the same way I parameterize pretty much every single line segment. We start at the point 1, 1. And then I'll add t times a direction vector, which I can get by subtracting the starting point from the end point. This would give us the vector negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. And then 1 minus 1 is 0. And every time you parameterize a line segment like this, the t bounds will range from 0 to 1. So that parameterizes the curve in the correct direction. And I do exactly what I did before. r2 prime is the vector negative 2, 0. So to get the normal vector, I reverse the order of the components. And then I multiply the new second component by a negative sign to get the vector 0, 2. And now we're ready to compute. The flux through C2 is going to be the integral from 0 to 1 that comes from our parameter bounds, f of the parameterization dot the normal vector. Again, f is just x, y, so this spits out the vector 1 minus 2 t 1. I dot that with 0, 2, and I just get 2 times 1, which is 2. And then integrating that from 0 to 1 is super easy, we get 2. And we're pretty much done. The flux through the whole curve is going to be the flux through C1 plus the flux through C2. So this is 2 thirds plus 2, which is 8 thirds. And like we suspected, we get some positive number. Now before you click away, I just want to make one quick remark about this example and about flux integrals in general. I mentioned this at the beginning, but I'll reiterate that you should really think about flux through a curve as just a special kind of scalar line integral. Not a vector line integral or a new kind of line integral or something like that. That can seem kind of confusing because there are so many parallels conceptually and computationally to computing a vector line integral. But the reason I say that is because this doesn't really behave like a vector line integral. You may have not been tempted to think about this, but just in case you were, this is what I mean. Think about this example we just computed. We had a closed curve in the vector field x, y. This vector field is defined everywhere on R2, and it's conservative on that domain. And a good quick exercise for you to do is to think about why that's true, but it is. And the only thing I want to point out is that we have a conservative vector field, and we computed some integral around a closed curve, but we did not get zero. So these flux integrals don't obey path independence or any of the conservative fundamental theorem stuff. They're just specific kinds of scalar line integrals. Anyway, that's flux. It's a mildly cool concept with a mediumly cool name, and it's something that we'll return to in the future when we start talking about surface integrals. So flux won't go away. We'll see it again soon enough. <laughs>